Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Tasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Tasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Sadu 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 Well, this week I was looking around and I found something really neat and I thought this would be really fun. I would stretch it about out across all of December and set it up in three lessons because I found a certain sutta that I liked. And um, it's a different way of looking at your progress. It's a different way of measuring sort of how you're doing and where you are with your practice. And so this uh, one monk, he wrote a really great expose on it, big enough to split into four parts and make it last all of December. Boy, I was excited. And then there was the AI lady in the computer <laughs> and she took my paper and it's all my fault because I was originally trained on computer. Whenever you put the paper up to write something, you title it and you save it before you start writing it. So May and I spent close to half an hour trying to find out where she hid the document. <laughs> and Actually, we ran into the classic thing where if you didn't name it when you started writing it and then you lose it, guess what? <laughs> you can't find it <laughs> because you can't ask for it in the, in, the, in the trash or you can't, the recycling bin or you can't find it. So this is like computers and you know, uh, you all know how old I am, okay, and uh, I went through this thing in the beginning. We told everybody who had word processors that computers will make your life a lot easier. We said computers make everything easier <laughs> until you this happens. <laughs> but in the beginning, Nobody believes that. And, and for some people, it's great. But once you have a, a bad experience, then for a while, this is like residual stuff that's from the past that shouldn't be there. <laughs> it creeps up on you and grabs you and says, ha ha, happened again. Anyway, when we talk about our practice, we have talked before about how um, the... Um, the Buddha measures the progress for his own monks. And we have said that we teach the same way he was teaching because we're teaching you a, a dual, you know, side by side practice that is parallel of learning the texts and the suttas. And uh, not, it isn't about learning the texts and the suttas. Let's say that again. You're learning the Buddha Dhamma that is necessary to support the development of your practice so that you can reach Nibbana. So when we're teaching you, we're teaching you the capsule. I've told you many times about the capsule uh, that that is what Bhante came up with. And we worked on it for like 10, 15 years to really refine it and say, this is exactly the minimum amount of foundation information a person has to have and able to reach to cessation and fall in and experience uh, the opening and come out and then start again to work for the fruition and, and so forth. So when the Buddha was measuring it for the monks, if you remember, I told you he said that the only one that was pleasant, the only one that was excellent progress was the one that was not painful. It was pleasant meditation with clear comprehension of the Dhamma. Okay, so that's what we've heard a lot about. And we can measure that in our practice. And now we use it in life. <laughs> you have to excuse me, but it rained here for two days. And that sort of introduced itself to my body. And my body said, what? 
<laughs> and, and my body has all kinds of reactions to this rain that just suddenly showed up. It's India, in life in India. So here we go. This one is called the Girama Nanda Sutta. Girama Nanda Sutta. Okay. It, you can find it in the book of tens. And just a second, I'm going to have to go to the door. <laughs> just one second. Nobody's here but me. Hold on. Sorry about that. I'm by myself today, so it's a little difficult. Okay, <clears throat> so this is called the Girama, Girama Nanda Sutta. It's found in the Anguttara Nikaya in the Book of Tens. And what, May, does everybody have this? They have the list. You should have the list of the different, this is a story about the 10 perceptions that need to be developed. So it's 10 perceptions that need to be developed in order to make your meditation work extremely well. And this also is interesting because it doesn't matter if you're practicing the breath or if you're practicing uh, the, uh, the Brahma Viharas, if you're practicing uh, Siddha yoga or you're practicing, it doesn't matter what kind of meditation that you're working with, it doesn't matter. These need to be developed in order for everything to go really well, according to the Buddha. So I'm going to just read them to you first. The first one is Anicca Sanya, and that's the perception of impermanence. This is understanding Anicca, getting a general understanding and developing the perception that everything is impermanent. Second one is Anatta Sanya perception of non-self. And actually what we would say is we would say it's a perception of the impersonal nature of everything, absolutely everything. Next one is a subha, a subha sanya, perception of ugliness and loathsomeness. Now, why do we have to get the loathsomeness and ugliness experience? because the majority of us are sort of addicted to the real beautiful and, and um, pleasant side of things. And what you realize in Buddhism, what's happening here, what's he actually doing? He's teaching you to go from the three, the three to the nine, and you, you wanna end up at six on the clock. You wanna end up here balanced, totally balanced in equanimity. So you can have an extreme of, of um, an extreme of the unwholesome, but you can also have an extreme of the wholesome and get so involved in lust and greed or hatred and aversion. Either way, you see? And either way, it's going to keep you from going into balance. And your atta is going to come up and all of your feelings and thoughts about this and opinions are going to butt in and not let you to go on a smooth journey with your practice. Next one is adhanara sanya, the perception of the disadvantage of the unwholesome side. So that's another piece of that, the clear perception of how it doesn't work if you're always in the unwholesome. Got it? Okay. 
And then the next one, the fifth one is Pahana Sanya. Perception of abandoning, giving up, removing. Now this is gets to the heart of the matter because the whole entire practice is a journey of cessation. Uh, it's like the diminishment of the music coming down, 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 down till you reach the condition that's right to fall off into cessation. So everything is working towards that. So it's the diminishment. It is the... Um, the abandoning, the giving up and removing, but not forcefully removing, not personally forcefully removing. We know this. We know that it's not about, I have to do this, make it happen. Uh -uh. It's I have to wake up and start allowing things to happen and allowing them to fall away. That's what is happening with the abandoning and giving up. So it is relinquishment, letting go, allowing, um, giving up and removing through what? Removing hindrances, for instance, but removing them because you have the knowledge of how they actually work. And once you understand the nutriment of the hindrance and withdraw the nutriment, the hindrance fades away, won't begin to come up much anymore, and then just disappears. It's all up to the balance of of what, how we get balanced in the removal of something is how much do we pay attention to what's happening or are we able to just grasp the idea of just witnessing what's occurring in the meditation. Viraga Sanya is the perception of disenchantment and dispassion. Now, usually it'll say the perception of dispassion. I put this in disenchantment and dispassion because on all of the other charts having to do with this cycle, you always go through disenchantment and dispassion very quickly, but there's two levels to it. So we need to stick that in there. So you remember when you get to the point where you just don't care about the things anymore. You're not interested anymore in the unwholesome sides of things. That that is the disenchantment stage moving towards dispassion. So that's a progress, okay? And then niroda sanya is the perception of cessation. And the percept only way to have a perception of cessation is to get to, to the get down the path and experience it one time. So you understand what it is. You know the joke I always talk to the person, say, how many times does an arahat and fruition experience uh, cessation, the nirodha, samapati? How many times? And it's basically eight times, right? It's not four times, it's eight times. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some, some teachings that will say, well, the, the, um, the fruition, when they say, and the fruition, they mean it comes instantly. They started doing that. We know they did that in the Mahasi tradition. They started doing that as an interpretation. But the problem with that, saying that whatever attainment happens, it's just like that, and the fruition is there. The problem is, Number one, in the school, the way it was set up, the meditation school for the Buddha, there were eight groups of monks practicing. There wouldn't have been eight groups of monks practicing for four attainments if that was true, would there? There wouldn't be those four separate groups. So the four separate groups are working towards Sotapanna, and then they shift to the next group to work towards Sotapanna and fruition. And it comes in at different times for people. We've witnessed this, and we know that that's true. From that's how it happens that they get back to cessation happen again, okay? Now, Sabaloka, Anabirata, Sanya, perception of non-delight in all worlds. Now that's it. that's these last three are pretty far along here after you get to cessation, and then you you realize I'm not interested in staying in this world beyond this life. Not interested. Okay, there's a free to not come back. You know, there's one little girl in this neighborhood, and she's got like I swear she must have five brothers. <laughs> five or six boys and just her and her decision natural 
survival decision <laughs> to survive all these boys was when she wanted her turn or she wanted, they were cheating her out of her turn and pushing her aside because she's a girl or something. She would just sit down and shriek. So she didn't cry. <laughs> she would just absolutely shriek as loud as she could. It's almost a natural instinct. We've watched this this family for like a whole year. Is something being wrong or is she being mistreated? She's not being mistreated. If you can watch her out my window, it's like a it's like a family uh, sitcom. <laughs> you know, right outside the window, sometimes I'll turn and look out the window. She's not being mistreated. She's just having to deal with the fact she's the only girl in the family other than her mother who's always busy and doesn't want to put up with trying to make the boys treat her better, you know? So the mom's always busy and her way is to really push, push, push. So this is a reason to leave this world, <laughs> not have that happen, not to be born into another family where you get beat up all the time and pushed around and everything. You can see her reasoning this out. That's not a bad idea to do something so I don't have to ever come back and go through that, that again. And she's only like about, I don't think she's in school yet. I don't think she is. So she's got a long way to go. <laughs> but I, you look at this another way. You say, most girls I know that grew up with a lot of brothers, they are some tough cookies. They, nobody's going to push them around. They are pretty tough, you know. So that's because of the brothers. And the brothers end up protecting them too most of the time. So the ninth one is Saba Sankaresu. Anicca Sanya, perception of all formations as undesirable. Now, this is not something for the lay person to concentrate. Everybody likes ice cream, but I'm not going to desire it anymore. Let's not go there. <laughs> but this, the lay person, does the lay person have to do this on five precepts, get to this level where everybody loves to have a piece of birthday cake and you know, ice cream and no, this is where we have a problem in Buddhism with people taking the advanced levels of something and pretending, forcing themselves to be on the six. Like I said, you know, here is the three here and this nine here. And what you want to do is get balanced totally to the six. Okay. Down here. But this is not for the person that's trying to live a household life. And to get to that extreme would be very uncomfortable in a family situation. You can see how this would work unless everybody was doing it together. Ah, do we have, a, do we have an example of that? Yes, a matter of fact, we do. In, in Shibota Center, which is in Malaysia, it's a meditation center Bhante and I used to go to to teach. And there was a family that came with 10 members in the family. And they left with four or five soda panas. This was a great experience, you know. And some of those soda panas were not the older ones, were the younger children. So they were a supporting system, a whole support system. And they weren't, they were totally supportive of each other and helping each other to work on their their uh, practice and we thought it was a beautiful example of being able to go home and talk about what you're doing and not have everybody say well that's not real or this or that or the other to you because they don't know what they're talking about because they haven't experienced it how that's the problem it's it's a challenge not a problem but a challenge for you in a country where there's not a tremendous number of people attempting to do the same thing. So you can't talk about some people, you can't talk to them about the way we're doing this because they think we have to really concentrate and really make things happen and really be forceful and strong. And when that happens, you can't, you can't explain to them what this is about. So you have to kind of keep it to yourself most of the time.
The last one of these is Anapanasati, perception of mindfulness of breathing. That's because this sutta was actually written in a way that's designed for the breathing meditator because that's what this one was talking about, okay? But when you listen to these in the sutta and listen to the detail that's involved in them, I want you to think about it because if you were no longer, um, if you were no longer out of balance with your perception of these things, as you go through the sutta, you would figure out, I would get to that place where I would be able, definitely be able to go down path much more easy. Okay. So now we go to the sutta. We're going to follow here if you need to. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anapapindika's Park. And on that occasion, the Venerable Giramananda was sick, afflicted, and gravely ill. And then the Venerable Ananda approached the Blessed One. He paid homage to him. He sat down at one side and he said to him, Bhante, the venerable Giramananda is sick. He is afflicted and gravely ill. It would be good if the blessed one would visit him out of compassion. If Ananda, you visit the bhikkhu Giramananda and speak to him about the 10 perceptions. It is possible that on hearing about these, his affliction will immediately subside. What are the 10? Now, one of the things I want to point out to you is that when Ananda went there to him, he didn't have any idea he was going to talk to him about these 10 perceptions. He thought that he would treat it the normal way of using the Ratana Sanda and, and um, chanting that. But this is another sutta that can be chanted and drilled into a person's mind by learning to develop these perceptions clearly of these 10 things. And when you do that, you're absolutely letting go and not going inward to hold on to what is making you ill. You're letting go and relaxing the body. So what's important about relaxing, or relaxing the body when you're ill is when we do research, oh, the doctors, the medical guys, they get all excited. <laughs> they're excited, you know, with the EGs and they're excited in the neuroscience, but they're excited also the medical guys. Let's watch what happens to the skin, watch what happens to the blood, watch what happens to your eyesight, go on and on and on. They want to test absolutely everything. And what do they find? They find that the further you move towards cessation of concern, tension, tightness, worry, all this stuff, worry about what might happen if this is this or this or this, all that. If you let go of all of that and you're living closer in to the present time and that's all you're occupying, just what's happening each time as you go through, boy, that body is able to fight. That body is able to heal itself much faster than if you were constantly worried and constantly upset about it. So number one, the perception of impermanence. Number two is perception of non-self. Number three is perception of unattractiveness, it says in this sutta. And number four is perception of danger. Number five is perception of abandoning, giving up. Perception of dispassion is number six. Number seven is perception of cessation. Number eight, perception of non-delight in the entire world, or in the other case, they said all worlds. And uh, the perception, number nine, um, impermanence, in all conditioned phenomena. And the last one, 10, is mindfulness of breathing. So here we go, number one. And what, Ananda, is the perception of impermanence? Here, having gone to the forest, to the foot of a tree, or to an empty hut, a monk reflects thus, 
form is impermanent. The body is impermanent. Feeling is impermanent. Perception is impermanent. Volitional activities are impermanent. Consciousness is impermanent. And thus he dwells contemplating the impermanence of all of the five aggregates that are subject to clinging. This is called the perception of impermanence. Always remember the aggregates are not suffering. The aggregates when affected by clinging are suffering. That's important to remember that. You get the wrong idea if people think that we think that we believe that the whole, everything is uh, suffering. It's not that way, okay? When it says subject clinging, is the suffering is subject clinging or not clinging. Number two, what Ananda is the perception of non-self. Now here, having gone to the forest, to the foot of a tree or an empty hut, that monk will reflect thus, the I is non-self, not me, not mine, not myself. Forms are not in self. The ear is non-self. Sounds are non-self. Nose is non-self. Odors are non-self. Tongue is non-self. Tastes are non-self. And the body is non-self. Tactile objects are non-self. So the objects of the, you see. Mind is non-self. Mental phenomena are non-self. And thus he dwells contemplating non-self in these six internal and external sense spaces. And this is called the perception of non-self or what? A perception of the impersonal nature of all of these things. That's where we go with that translation because non-self doesn't really tell you what it is. We think of uh, self and non-self must take the place of self. That's what people tell me. And I'm there. No, 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 no. <laughs> that, that gets a little confusing if you make that slip and you start thinking, well, that's the answer. It's better to think of it as impersonal and imper totally impersonal in nature. <clears throat> Number three is what Ananda is the perception of unattractiveness. Here, a monk reviews this very body upwards from the soles of the feet and downward from the tips of the hairs, enclosed in a skin as, as full of many kinds of impurities, remembering that the body has body hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, and sinews, bones and bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, pleura, spleen, lungs, intestines, mesentery, stomach, the excrement, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, saliva, snot, fluid of the joints, and urine. And thus he dwells contemplating the unattractiveness of the body. It is called the perception of the unattractiveness. Now, what always comes up for me about this is the uh, lay person who read about this and he came to me one day and he says, but I like to go to the gym and work out. If I'm a Buddhist, can I do that? Otherwise, I'm not going to become a Buddhist because I like to go to the gym and work out. I said, does it mean I can never work out at the gym again if I'm a Buddhist? <laughs> and I had to think for a minute because one point in time, I spent roughly six months in a gym trying to bring back my body after an accident. And I said, no, I mean, if you're building your muscles, that's fine. But the place you have to be careful, you're, you're taking, toning the body, making the stamina stronger, um, the strength and then the stamina and uh, strength building is an important thing for the gyms nowadays. Of course you can do that. 
you just don't spend 30 minutes by the mirror flexing this particular muscle, see? <laughs> you don't start attempting to be Atlas, you know, in a picture, getting yourself to that point. And you're never going home to play with the kids or say hello to the wife or vice versa, you see? Are you addicted to the gym or are you using the gym as a tool to strengthen the body? That's a big difference. So he started looking at that, spending a little less time at the gym, a little more time playing with his kids. He's a very nice man. Anyway, the next one is, and what Ananda is the perception of danger? Here, having gone to the forest, to the foot of a tree or an empty hut, one would reflect thus, this body is the source of much pain and danger. All sorts of afflictions can arise in the body. That is the eye disease, the disease of the inner ear, the nose disease, the tongue disease, the body disease, the head disease, the disease of the external ear, the mouth disease, the tooth disease. One can cough, have asthma, cataract, parexia, fever, stomach aches, fainting, dysentery, gripes means complaining, cholera, leprosy, boils, eczema, tuberculosis, epilepsy, ringworm, itches, scabs, chickenpox, scabies, hemorrhage, diabetes, hemorrhoids, cancer, a fistula, illnesses originating from bile and phlegm, from wind or their combination. Illness is produced by the change of the climate. Illness is produced by careless behavior. Illness is produced by assault from someone else or illness is produced as the result of karma burning off from another time. And cold, heat, hunger, thirst, defecation and urination. And thus he dwells contemplating the danger in having a body such as this. And this is called the perception of danger. I wouldn't want to worry too much about it, but it's a good idea to learn to take care of yourself while you're growing up. Listen to your mother and your grandmother tell you all the different things that you can do with simple things like baking soda and salt soaks and all types of, well, one, my favorite one is if you're bitten by something, it starts to, to get sore. You can slice potatoes and put it on and wrap it on there because when the potato dries out, it sucks things right out of the bite. That's a good one. We have lots of, and over here, you have a lot of things, you know, you're more familiar than most people are in the world of what's growing around them. So they're using in Sri Lanka, every little house had medicine plants around the house everywhere. And here people are very familiar with using things and buying them at the market, using ginger and honey and lemon juice properly for sore throats, all these things. So there's all these different things you can learn about to take care of yourself. But this is true with every living thing that lives on the planet. It's not just for a human being, everybody who has a body of any kind has to face the dis dis-ease of that body in one way or another. Number five is, and what Ananda is the perception of abandoning. Here, one does not tolerate an arisen sensual thought. He abandons it, <clears throat> dispels it, terminates it and obliterates it. Now, this is a good spot for you to see how these, these work. To abandon something is to let it, just release it, just abandon it and it falls away. To dispel it is just to toss it away. To terminate it, to terminate it could sound forceful if you didn't have any knowledge about how it worked. This is the key secret to this. So when we take suttas that appear maybe in the front of a, a book and we don't go to further into the book to read about how things work that are annoying us, 
if you abandon something and not pay any attention to it anymore, you're basically obliterating it because you have taken the food away from the disturbance, distraction, or whatever is causing you to be disturbed. So you have to remember that without that knowledge, that's the person who is struggling hard to destroy, annihilate, eliminate, eradicate, obliterate, terminate, stop, suffocate, subdue, and press down whatever is bothering you. But as soon as you try to do that, then you don't have to worry about hell because hell starts to be on earth with you. In that moment, you will make it worse and worse and worse if you do that. So once again, go back to what I said before about the body and the medical people being interested in the research. The most interesting part for them is how much better a body, faster and more precisely, a body can cure itself once the tension and tightness and concern and the mental part here is only working in conjunction with healing the body. So all these things are tied together. They're all part of the same weaving. He does not tolerate any arisen thought of ill will um, or of anything or an arisen thought of harming or bad unwholesome states. Whenever they arise, he abandons them, dispelling them, terminating them and obliterating them. And this is called the perception of abandoning what it means to let go, let go. Number six, what Ananda is the perception of dispassion? Here, having gone to the forest, the root of a tree or an empty hut, one reflects, this is peaceful, this is sublime, and that is the stilling of all activities external, the relinquishment of all acquisitions, living with almost nothing around you, the destruction of craving, the desire, dispassion, and then eventually Nibbana, that these things, um, the perception of dispassion towards anything anymore. Dispassion even goes deeper than that. And, you know, it's hard to find people that have actually experienced it. Um, equanimity in its heaviest state before Nibbana is dispassion before cessation. That's the end just before you fall in. <clears throat> but many times people don't get to test this. And what I discovered is the different levels of equanimity, which occur in the first, second, third, and fourth jhana until you get to very quiet mind and the equanimity is very strong and supportive and then you fall into disenchantment when you're not sitting and walking around you start to notice the disenchantment and then this passion falls in and you fall through to cessation when you come out it's borderline dispassion and imperturbable mind means it's more imperturbable mind means it's more permanently dispassionate because you're turned off, okay, for a period of time. That's the arahat, you see. And everybody has this for a little while when you go through the different attainments. But going back to the mountain, I got in the truck to go down and get the milk. They told me they wanted me to. And I forgot that the brakes needed to be worked on. And when the rain was on the mountain, it's six miles down the mountain in the mud. This is the old location where we had before where we are now. And I got to the part where it goes down really steep like this. Okay, really steep. And at the bottom, you have to turn very sharp and go down again. And then you have to turn one more time to go continue on the road. And what's beside you the whole time is a cliff. When I got to that spot, the rain was coming very hard. I started sliding and I realized the brakes weren't there. But I didn't get scared. I did what I needed to do and got down to the bottom of the mountain. 
leave it at that because we'll keep a short version of this. But at the bottom, when I managed to pump the brakes and stop about this far away from the cliff I was going towards, <laughs> that's when it stopped. I thought immediately the flash in my mind is this was really frightening. So I'm waiting for my body <laughs> and I, for my heart to go like that and for my stomach to jump and for things to happen. And the thing was, nothing happened. I took my pulse and had a runner's pulse about 58. There was nothing happening. My stomach was absolutely calm. And I'm thinking like, what in the world is this? What is this? This is real equanimity, a full-blown, strong equanimity with dispassion of you never came in your brain at all to be concerned about what was happening. And yet you were able to see what was going on in the present time frame, know exactly what to do in order to go down and make that turn and the other turn without hitting anything. You have to understand on the one side, there's a cliff on the other side, there's 200 foot drop, 150 drop, 100 foot drop into the river. <laughs> you see. So when I started driving again, I drove up pretty fast actually to get to the store. And then when I got there, I told Jane what was happening. And, it, I, and she said, you look angry. I said, yeah, I'm getting close to it. I wonder why Bonte never explained this to us. He never told us about this possibility that this could happen like this. Years later, I heard someone trying to explain um, equanimity and just not explaining equanimity, uh, the difference between equanimity and um, what's that called? When you just don't care, you know, you just don't care. You say it's pleasant, it's neutral, it's neither pleasant nor it's neither pleasant nor painful. Dis, what do you call it? You're not, you're disinterested. You're like disinterested in it. Is that the uh, word? Indifferent. In, indifferent. indifferent. So the question you need to look at here is what is the difference between indifference and um, equanimity? What is the difference? Okay. And the answer to it is that equanimity has perfect mindfulness, which is what occurred in that, in that little adventure was perfect mindfulness, but indifference has no mindfulness, none whatsoever. And I think that's the best definition I've ever heard anybody actually explain that. So that's what happened. And so this is a real state. You can get to it. The thing is, most people are not put in a position where they've been sitting. At the time that happened, I was sitting about three hours or more each time. And I, it, the way we were doing it was going out for the day to work, working until we felt the urge to drink water and then sit quiet for a while. And we would sit and nobody's out there with us. We're working in different parts of the forest, clearing the road, clearing the building uh, area, whatever you're working on. And I was sitting long, but I didn't realize what was happening. I knew work was very pleasant because it was nothing to disturb you at all. And you ran your own, your own rate of work and everything when you were doing this kind of work, which is heavy, pretty heavy work. But it's just interesting, you know, that nothing happened in the heart, nothing happened in the stomach, and definitely something should have been going on. This was the way he looked at it. Okay, so we, this is just passion. Now we look and what Ananda is um, the perception of cessation. And once again, he's in the forest at a root of a tree, empty hut, reflects, and he'll, what is that? What cessation? It's a peaceful, sublime stilling of all activities, relinquishment of all acquisitions, destruction of craving and the cessation, and then the experience of going through Nibbana and coming out. That's what's called the perception of cessation. So the whole sutta is talking to about awareness in perceiving and, and your um, uh, sharpening of your attention but your attention and your awareness are growing to a very fine tune. 
And what Ananda is the perception of non-delight. We talked to, I think, uh, non-delight is the dispassionate type thing where you refrain from the engagement and clinging to mental standpoints, adherences, and underlying tendencies in regard to the world, abandoning them without clinging to them. And this is called the perception of non-delight in the entire world. This is probably would be a real healthy exercise for both political parties or all political parties concerned in the United States right now. <laughs> Maybe they should do this. Maybe they should actually uh, work on their perception of their non-delight, meaning letting go of, listen to this, you would have to, it's impossible for it to happen right now. They would have to let go, both sides, okay, of any mental standpoints. Adherences are a, an idea that you absolutely, this is right. That's what adherence to somebody, something is. And the underlying tendencies in regards to the world, how they feel about the world, how they think the world should run. Everybody should just stop right now because of what's happening. And abandoning them without clinging to them means you don't go home and just hold on to them and keep harping on it, you see. I don't think that can happen, but that's about what that's like. And this is called perception of non-delight in the entire world. Next one is number nine. What is the perception of impermanence? Okay, and the impermanence in all conditioned phenomena. So you understand that here the monk is repelled, humiliated, disgusted by all conditional um, phenomena. I always thought that disgusted and uh, there was another term was a bit harsh that you couldn't be uh, disgusted in something unless you were personally involved. Do you understand what I'm saying? Can a human being be disgusted about something unless they have a passion for disliking it? You see, so I always thought this was kind of a bad word to be here, but I haven't worked out the Polly with anybody yet about that, why, whether it's that way. There's another word they say too, that in the translations, I think it's just too harsh, but I think it's coming from translators that are not actually, you know, having this experience yet of just letting go and letting things happen. If they're still struggling in their practice and maybe that's part of what's going on, be interesting to find out. Uh, all conditioned phenomena. So whatever arises in your mind is conditioned phenomena and it's called the perception of impermanence. You wanna keep the perception of impermanence in your mind about all conditioned phenomena. So one of the things I, I had happen in Sri Lanka, I arrived, I came back from Australia or something, I can't remember. And they said, you're gonna stay over here before we take you to where you're gonna stay. We're gonna stay here at the family's house. And this was a big house and 35 people were waiting inside, they told me. And I said, well, what's it about? You can just ask, answer questions. They just wanna ask questions and get advice, things like that, or solutions to stuff. And I said, well, who, who's in there? And she said, well, we're letting the teenagers ask the questions, see? So went inside, sat on the couch, had some tea, and then they all gathered around. And um, this one girl was like, you know, I, I want to ask the question. So I said, okay, ask good. And then she starts with the first adventure. <laughs> and the adventure was, well, it's about my mother. That's the first thing she says. She's 17 years old. And she says, it's about my mother. And my mother just doesn't seem to think, doesn't seem to understand that I have a life. And when I want to go with my friends to the mall, I need to just go with my friends to the mall. And uh, I said, well, what happened? She said, my mother came to me and said, before you go with your friends to the mall, I want you to help me clean the clean the house because grandma's coming and I don't want the house to be a mess when your grandmother comes. 
but I have to go, she said. And she said, just call him and tell him that you'll be about 15 minutes. He can help me. No, he says, I have to have this right now, you see. And, and then I said to her, well, if you're having so much trouble with your mother, did you ever stop and think for a minute that maybe what you could do is wait 10 minutes? And she looked at me and I said, well, why would I do that? Because everything is changing all the time. And because whatever you put into a situation, that's what you get back out of it. So maybe if you cooperated with her for like five minutes or 10 minutes, an agreement to clean your room or the living room or something, maybe the two of you could work together. It's called cooperation. <laughs> and, and she looked at me kind of funny and she said, um, but that's, is, are you answering my question? I said, of course I am. And if you're upset about your mom or she's upset about you, if you guys wait 10 or 15 minutes and consider alternatives to the situation, you might come up with a plan for cooperation where you both get what you want. At that point was really funny because her mother broke down laughing because she was sitting right next to her. <laughs> and she, she, they both looked at me and said, well, can we do that? And she said, I think it would be fun. Her mom said, okay, why don't you try that? Because you have to understand that you both need to respect each other. And then what we did was we went to 128 Upak Kalesa Sutta and we read the first part of the Upak Kalesa Sutta. And um, what is in that sutta is about those three monks that were living together. You know, and the Buddha went away, I think it was from Kasambi, and went to stay with them because the monks were fighting in Kasambi. He told them not to, but they kept fighting. So he just left and went over there to visit them. And in that, in 128, you'll find it right in the first, before the parts about the hindrances, you will find it. The questions for the monks living together is on page. 1011, 1011. It starts in section 11, and I think it goes until 15, from 11 to 15. That's all. You, you read that section, and it's talking about how um, three monks are able to live together without any quarreling at all. Now, I used to take this and I used to read it to the Girl Scouts or the Boy Scouts before they went on a camping trip <laughs> and said, this is what you do just for the camping trip. This is what you do. And this description, we blend together like milk and water. If I'm lifting something, it's too heavy. We don't speak. You can come over, May can come over and help me lift the other side. And then it's light for us to carry if we do this together. And so this was a really cool thing, you know, that that um, that was in there and you could read it and understand right away how to get together with each other and keep working. And then from here, from the impermanence. In the middle of any situation you're in, you always remember something. Everything that happens to you or that's going on in life, every single thing has a beginning, has a middle, and it has an end. A beginning, a middle, and an end. Okay? So just remember that. When you have something where the boss has asked you to stay late and he's asked you to finish it because the corporation wants the deadline met, you know, where they're going to have a big meeting to look at how everything is operating or something like that. And you have all this extra work to do. You keep this in mind. This too shall come to pass. <laughs> this too has a beginning, a middle and an end. There are times at the end of the month in most businesses. There are times at the, at the end of each quarter in the businesses. Yeah, that's the monthly thing. Or it, at the quarterly statements for the development of a company and its goals and its determination and what's going to happen. That's the time when everybody gets uptight. 
but there's going to be an end and a pizza party <laughs> when you get to the end <laughs> or a tea party wherever you are that's what happens okay so and what ananda is mindfulness of breathing here um, a monk gone to the forest to the root of a tree to an empty hut he sits down folds his legs crosswise because that's the most way comfortable way to sit in asia that's why straightens the body and establishes mindfulness in front of him just mindful he breathes in and mindful he breathes out mindfulness is an observation just an observation not a concentration but just an observation now what i did manage to do for you was when you turn the page on this um he understands i breathe in short or or breathing out short he understands i breathe out short he understands is really important. That's what those two first, that, that first uh, dyad, two dyads there, that's what they're about is like the setup. And when you hear in the beginning, he's not training, he simply breathes in and he breathes out long and then he breathes in, he breathes out short. Then in the next part, you take, the four dyads and put them together, the four dyads, and then the, the three dyads at the end, and then the last dyad in the bottom is hooked to the one at the top. So you have four sets of four dyads, but the first one is a setup for practicing. And then when you go in the first uh, collection of those four dyads, you'll see when, and he's training, he experiences the whole body. It's not a body of breath he's, ex, he's concentrating on to experience. It's air, it doesn't have a body, okay? So it's not the, it's not the air, it's not the body of breath. It's, it's just the whole body, meaning where's the Buddha say the body is forever in all his suttas from the top of your head or the root of the hair on your head, that's one way of saying it, but the top of your head, to the soles of your feet. Here's a question, where is the world? Do you remember what Ananda was told? Where is the world, Lord, he said. And he said, Ananda, the world is from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. That's where the world is, the whole entire world. And right there, he's actually telling you, you actually create the world. You create the world. It isn't there. The question that really opened me up with actually Bunty Poonaji, and it was in the year 2000, it was in the Washington Buddhist temple and he was giving a talk and he proposed to the audience, he said, what came first? Experience or existence? That's the question. What came first? the experience or the existence. Mm -hmm. See, most people will say the existence had to come first because you couldn't have the experience unless the existence was there. They're out there though. Okay, but when you come in here, <laughs> actually the experience creates the existence. You create each day of your life. I was a Christian for 50 years. And growing up as a little girl, I knew if things were hard and things were hard then from about, I was very ill the first six years, but then for the next three or four, things were fairly good, but then there's crashing down that came and things fell apart from nine years old on. Very hard. What sustained me was someday, someday I would be able to go back to heaven. 
someday. Do you see this? And the older I got, the more serious that statement was because it never came, you see. And the truth was, if only someone had pointed out to me, and I was a pretty happy kid, and if I stayed away from where the things were not going well, if I stayed at the farm with the geese and the cows and the chickens and the bull and the sheep and the ducks, everything was fine, <laughs> just fine, okay. When I came home, there was a big ruckus and I would go outside one way or another. I would go outside from away from the house and go up in a tree house and just stay there. That was my solace, my place, my tiny little place to go. Stay in the tree house. Yeah. I didn't know that I could create my experience the existence. I didn't know I could create it each day, see? But we are that powerful that we determine what is going to happen in front of us by what we do right here now, yeah? So the more smiles that you smile, because you know this helps you to smile in your head and everything in your perspective, the more smiles will come naturally. Your brain is learning all the time by what you do with it. It is an open learning machine. And we forgot to tell our children that. Because that means you can create what is going to happen today. You could get ready for it at home and set yourself up and go in maybe it's a bad day at the office for a lot of people, but you're not. Why? Because this is just the way it is today, but you made a decision to smile through it and that changes everything. So when you look at this, if you wanna go over it, I'll let you guys go over it, but what this is, these instructions for the breathing meditation. And when you go over it, you begin to understand you're just observing. That's all. You're just witnessing what's occurring. That's the secret to the whole thing. When they take, um, when I was looking at this, I was thinking, you know, when they take the Satipatthana and they say, that's all we need, just the Satipatthana Sutta, that's it, that's Buddhism. Oops. Why oops? Because there are things in there that you really do need to understand in Satipatthana, but you cannot understand if you do not understand other parts of the, thir the 37 requisites of enlightenment and the Four Noble Truths and dependent origination. You have to have enough of the pieces to be able to just understand what's happening in Satipatthana or Maha Satipatthana Sutta. The big message in practice as much as you can is whatever is irritating you, whenever it's happening, it whenever. This is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. This is just this particular present time. I can move and keep going and change. You really are in charge, you really are powerful. The first retreat I ever, I'm not gonna read through the instructions, so you, let you review that yourself, okay? But the, um, he says in the end, if Ananda, you visit Giriman, Girimananda and speak to him about these 10 per perceptions, it is possible that on hearing about them, he will immediately recover from his affliction. So if a person is a practicing meditator and they're working on all of this and you were to read this to them and share this with them, it would give them focal points to practice their perception on these pieces instead of what? Lying there in pain and only thinking about the pain, okay? 
the one thing you have to remember anytime you find anything in a translation that points to if a pain arises, I'll sit with it, I'll stay with it. You know something beyond that. And you know there's something wrong going on with that directive. You can test it for yourself. In this case, when the Venerable Ananda learned his 10 perceptions from the Blessed One and he went to Giram Ananda and he told them him about it, when he heard about these, his affliction immediately subsided and the Venerable Giram Ananda recovered from the affliction and that was how, uh, that, how he was cured for his affliction. A lot of times, when we have pains in our body, when we're older, I think the one thing we need to keep around more than anything <laughs> is menthol. Uh, what is it called? Menthol and um, eucalyptus, menthol, eucalyptus, and peppermint. Yeah, peppermint. Menthol, eucalyptus, and peppermint. I searched and searched, and I finally found this little guy. This little guy is in over here in India. Great stuff. And basically what's going on is exactly that. Menthol, eucalyptus, and peppermint. And peppermint immediately stops the pains in your wrists, you know, from where you hurt sometimes when you're working on computer, your elbows, your knees, it immediately stops. And then it doesn't start again if you get a little bit of exercise and then go back and sit down. This is it. So I'm open for questions. We've got about um, probably 10 or 15 minutes here. We can take questions. Anybody have questions on this one? It's obviously this is not gonna go on all month. Uh, we, like I said, we had this other plan and the computer ate it. <laughs> So after three hours last night of working a whole program for December, and then another half hour with May trying to find out where it was in the computer, it turns out when I did, I just went to bed and turned off the computer and that was the end of the document. So I'll put a big sign here now. Name the document when you start writing and save the document. <laughs> It's a classic piece of instruction for working on computers. So anybody have a question? Hmm? No questions. Okay. So these are perceptions. What am I perceiving? How is it working? Am I perceiving the things that we're talking about in retreat? and uh, such. And by the way, there are retreats coming up. They're starting again. So in January, there's going to be a retreat from the, um, the 6th of January till the 16th. And then again, from the 20th of January to the 30th of January. And then these uh, retreats will be held at Jetwan Monastery in Yawat Mall. So this is near Nagpur. You go to fly to Nagpur and then you short distance to drive to Yawat Mall. And this, uh, we're not able to use the new, the brand new setup yet <laughs> because they didn't finish the floors. They're not on schedule. But we're happy to use the old arrangement because we had two really great retreats there in 2019, I want to say, was when we were there last time. We had very, very good retreats there. And it's a wide open area for walking. And now they have um, put in um, stone walkways where you can walk that are all flat in this big flat part with lots of statues and beautiful things to see that are from um, Buddhist archeology span type stuff. And there's a pond. My understanding is now there's water in the pond. <laughs> a number of ways back there wasn't, there's actually water in the pond. 
and we'll see what happens. So we're taking 20 seats on each of those, each of those uh, retreats. There's only 20 seats in each one. And that'll be the beginning and we'll see where we go from there. Um, they want us to keep working with them there. If we can, we will. Um, and it might mean that I have to stay there for a while over there if we're doing retreats each month. But once again, I'm running into trouble because of breathing here. <laughs> breathing is interesting to be breathing air that you can write your name in it every afternoon. <laughs> if you wash the floor, you can still write your name on the floor in the afternoon. <laughs> yeah, so it might be healthy for me to stay there, but we'll just have to see what it comes and just stay in the present time and not worry about anything and everything will work out. And so I'll give you a blessing. Let's give our prayer, okay. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you. We'll see you all next week. And we'll have to, you should write me a note if there's something you really want to get into, or I'll have to, uh, I'll invent something for December and we'll come up with a good idea. <laughs> but let me know what your thinking is. If you want to run a little survey and find out what people are thinking about what they want to do. Okay. There's two more pieces to the, um, uh, the series that I have to. I found them and then I lost them, but I know where they are. <laughs> Does it sound hopeful? <laughs> I know there's a file in there I have to go find again. There's two more pieces that we haven't done. So we can look at that too, okay? One of them was on purification of the mind. The other one was on um, retraining the mind. So they have a little bit to do with the neuroscience, a little bit to do with understanding why we get so excited about this practice because it really does work when you're retraining the brain. Okay. See you next time. Keep smiling.